My name is Lisa Olson. I'm the Director of Programming, and we are so delighted to have you here in person. I'll, maybe I'll come up here behind you. Uh, in person for the discussion of Alex Kershaw's latest book, Against All Odds, joined with Kelly Kennedy. Uh, Kelly is an award-winning journalist. She's also the managing editor of The War Horse. And Kelly is the only American woman who has both served in US combat with the US Army and covered US combat as a civilian embedded both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Kelly is also um, has a best is a best-selling author of Sorry. They Fought for Each Other, and she's a co-author of Kate Germano's Fight Like a Girl. So please join me in welcoming both Kelly and Alex. Thanks, and I'd like to introduce Alex. <laughs> he was a best-selling author of Against All Odds. Uh, you've written several World War II books and a book about Jack London, and you were, have been a journalist for 30 years, and you went to school with my dear friend, Christina, Tina Lamb. <laughs> I did. Yeah. And I'm very excited to ask you some questions about your book tonight. So if everyone could welcome Alex. <laughs> Thanks. Um, shall I show a few photographs so we know what yeah, we're talking about? Um, I don't want you guys to like crick your neck or anything like that, but anyway, uh, it'll make it a lot easier. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. It's very nice of you to, to arrive. I'm actually in awe of you because you're the real deal. You've actually served in combat and reported on it, which is um, really incredible. So thank you. Um, I uh, became obsessed with, uh, I'm a bit obsessed with World War II, as you can tell. I've written 10 books now, way too many, about World War II. And I, a few years ago, went and interviewed a guy called Bob Maxwell, who at the time was the oldest living recipient of the Medal of Honor. He was 98. Uh, there were only four living recipients of the Medal of Honor from 472 who received it in World War II. The majority of the 472 were not alive when they received it. They received it posthumously. He was one of four left alive and there's only one guy left alive today. So out of 472 amazing people, we only have one. It's Woody Williams. I think he's 98, 99, and he received it uh, aged 18 for actions at Iwo Jima. So when Woody passes away, I've interviewed him a couple of times, when he passes away, which I hope is not soon, there'll be no one left. And I think we have less than 300,000, Holly can confirm that, less than 300,000 from 16 million Americans that served in World War II in uniform. So we're looking at the sunset years of this generation. So anyway, I became obsessed with the Medal of Honor, with World War II, with Bob Maxwell, who belonged to the third ID. And you can see the, um, uh, the blue and the white stripes there. That's the third ID patch. Um, that's their journey. Uh, very quickly, because I'd rather be asked questions than ra ramble on. Um, the third ID lost the most Americans to liberate the place I grew up. I was 28 when I came here. I considered myself English but also European. I didn't get to vote against Brexit, so you know how I feel about that. <laughs> but I grew up in a beautiful place which was liberated by Americans, Canadians, and uh, Brits. But that was the longest journey you could make as a working class American to liberate Europe, North Africa, all the way to Berchtesgaden. The Screaming Eagles in Band of Brothers did not liberate Berchtesgaden. The third ID made damn sure they were there right at the end to gain that final glory. Most men lost, most Americans killed in the third ID, uh, longest in combat over 330 days. Some people, very, very few, managed to go from the beginning right to the end, and they received the largest number of Medal of Honors, Medals of Honor, rather. It's a bit of a tongue twister, that. Um, and there was a very good reason for it. Bob Maxwell was one of them. There were 36, I believe, in World War II, and four subsequently since World War II. The uh, first 
101st Airborne uh, had two recipients during World War II. So compare that to the third ID, 40. And that was almost a tenth of all of the Medal of Honours given out in the European theater. At the end of the war, after almost 140,000 Americans had been killed to liberate Europe, there were some 90 divisions, infantry divisions in Europe. And the third ID was one of them. So out of 90, this one infantry division had almost a tenth of all the medals. And that's because they were in so many intensely violent, brutal battles. In fact, they hold the record for the largest number of deaths from any one infantry division in World War II on one day. And that's the third ID, the Marne men, the patch again. And that was the breakout of Anzio in May 1944 when they lost over 900 men killed on one day. The nearest you can come to that in the European theater on one day would be Omaha Beach. That's the 29th and the first ID and the Rangers and that's on Omaha, just over 900 again. So anyway, I'll show you some faces and then we can talk. Um, Morris Britt, first American to receive every medal for valor that you could gain in World War II. Bronze Star, Silver Star, DSC, Medal of Honor, arm blown off at Anzio from Arkansas, um, an amazing athlete, and he's one of my four main characters. There's uh, Lucien Truscott, third ID commander. I believe one of the greatest combat, certainly div division commanders of World War II, a Patton-esque figure, and he commanded the third ID from Sicily all the way to the uh, Vosges Mountains in the fall of 1944, and was just a superb, very aggressive, uh, that's a, 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 an airman's jacket, leather jacket he's wearing. You won't see another infantry division commander wearing a 8th Air Force pilot's jacket, but he is. Um, let's move forward, sorry. There's Audie Murphy, one of my characters. Looks extremely young there because he is. He lied to get into the military. Um, one of the characters I write about in the book was his company commander and said that even though he was 18, he looked 13 or 14. Um, just, uh, I can't find the superlatives. We can talk about him later, but I can't find the superlatives to describe um, just how lethal, aggressive, and intelligent he was in combat. Um, I would have hated to have been a German anywhere near him. He was extremely uh, effective. Um, another of my characters, uh, Michael Daly, a uh, devout Irish Catholic from Connecticut, well-to-do, uh, upper middle class, um, decided to drop out of West Point, hated West Point, um, hated the hazing and the regimentation. He said, I couldn't stand all the discipline, which you would only expect him to accept at West Point, but he hated it. And um, became a grunt, became a private in the first ID, first day of combat in the first ID was Omaha Beach. Landed at 1.30 in the afternoon. Joined the third ID in January, late December of 1944, and joined the same unit as three of the other guys I write about. Received the Medal of Honor for actions in Nuremberg in April 1945. Shot through the head the day after. Um, and it's a miracle that he survived. He was given last rites. Um, Italy, Brit's scrapbook. Mountains in Italy where Brit received the performed actions for, um, for which he was awarded the Medal of Honor. There he is in hospital in May 1944. Was a superstar. He played for the Detroit Lions uh, as a professional football player and therefore came back and was uh, a very willing propaganda figure. Raised a lot of money for war bonds. And although he's losing, he lost his arm at Anzio, he has many, many shrapnel wounds and there wasn't a day that he lived beyond World War II where he wasn't in severe pain, severely wounded. And the smile on his face is incredible because that smile in public never really left him. I interviewed his grandson and said that he was, I never saw my granddad without a smile on his face. And he had a lot to be extremely in pain about and regret. He never played football again. He, had a, he was a professional football player that's Britt receiving the Medal of Honor in, at the Razorback Stadium at the University of Arkansas, day before D-Day, 
Um, they were actually going to ha have him receive it in Europe before the Allied invasion as a kind of pep propaganda event to boost the morale of the troops. But he, they decided it would be better if he went to his alma mater. And that's him there. You can see the, the sleeve tucked into his pocket. Um, Avenue of Stenches, after Operation Dragoon in August 1944, we had the Germans on the run. And uh, similar to in Normandy, um, we had total air. We had total control of the skies and uh, P-57, P-50, P-47s and uh, other dive bombers basically destroyed anything that moved and we killed an awful lot of Germans to the extent that it smelled so bad that they called it the Avenue of Stenches. Alexander Patch was the 7th Army commander. Um, he was the commander of the 45th, the 3rd ID and the 36th. Um, a brilliant general. I think he died at an early age. I think uh, younger than me, age 55, from a broken heart and the stress of combat and command. That's his son there. His son was, he had only had one son. He was killed in October 1944. And um, it definitely, it, it hurt a lot. In the book, I cite several letters where he talks to his wife about their private grief. Uh, that's Siegelsheim, Colmar Pocket, not a well-known battle. Keith Ware, one of my characters, who was Audie Murphy's com company commander in Sicily, commanded Audie Murphy all the way through the war. He said, you know, he looked 13, 14 when he was 18. Ware pulled him off the line and said, I'm not going to kill kids. And Murphy ignored his commands and then said, OK. Ware said, if you want to be in combat, you can be in combat. And that was in July 1943, and he was still in combat in March of 1945. And that's Sicily, all of Italy, all of France, the Vosges Mountains, and the Colmar Pocket, where uh, Keith Ware received the, as a battalion commander, as a lieutenant colonel, earned the Medal of Honor. And we can talk about why later on, but uh, I've been there uh, with a very good friend of mine. That's Holtzfeer. Again, calm my pocket. Audie Murphy on that tank for an hour, repelled Germans, was wounded. Uh, the tank was burning, and that's the action for which he received the Medal of Honor. Uh, calm my pocket. Again, Michael Daly, the guy I mentioned to you earlier. Look at his face, look at the, the body, look at how he's tall, look at how thin his fingers are. They estimated that you would lose a pound in weight for every day that you were in combat in World War II. I wrote a book about a guy that was in the 45th that lost, he told me that he lost 40 pounds in six weeks. Um, it, it particularly affected people that were obviously at the sharp end, but officers, at, in some ways I would argue, uh, junior officers or rather officers at a lieutenant, captain, sometimes major, lieutenant colonel. If you were an, involved as a lieutenant colonel or a major and wanted to be at the front, near the front, if you were a very good officer, the combat stress was not only from the stress of being in combat, but also round-the-clock decisions, survivor's guilt, uh, making decisions that you knew could get people killed in large numbers if you're a, a battalion commander, certainly. You get it wrong, dozens of people die, and you're doing that day in, day out, very little sleep, and the stress not only of combat but of decision-making really takes its toll. He was a company commander at age 20, and he was a company commander for week after week after week from, from basically February of 1945 right to the end of the war. He had 200 Americans under his command and he was 20 years old. Um, it's an enormous, incalculable stress and it stays with you forever in many ways. Uh, spring 1945, we are finally near the end. Um, it's been a very long journey for the 3rd Division, and we find autobahns, and uh, we roll, and we destroy anything in our path, and we finally have, when we've crossed the Rhine, we have some momentum. And we kill and destroy anything that gets in our way. If they don't show white tablecloths in village windows, we shell the village and we destroy everything. 8th Air Force, 9th Air Force, 8th Air Force just bombed target opportunity. The RAF are killing old guys on bikes. We don't stop. 
we hate the Germans, we have had so much, we've done it for so long, we've lost so many men, that we want it to be over. And we'll do anything to end it. Um, in, in the Pacific, we dropped the nuclear bomb to end it. We didn't care. We really wanted it to end. And it was the same in Europe. Uh, that's Nuremberg, which we bombed the hell out of. We first hit Nuremberg in 1940. Over 70% of the city was a ruin. Um, unfortunately, urban combat uh, among the ruins, among ruins is very, very deadly. Urban combat is very deadly to this day. Um, as the Ukrainians are finding out as I speak right now in Maripol, um, it's incredibly lethal when the tide turns against you. Um, the Germans fought right to the end, especially the SS. And in Nuremberg, the heart of Nazism, where the Nuremberg rallies had occurred, it was a sacred place. It was worth dying in. You're not only dying, dying for your homeland, you're not only dying for Nazism, you've known nothing else, you're a 19 year old, you're dying in a place that has massive symbolic significance and you're dying wanting to take out as many Americans as you possibly can. You want to kill as many Americans as you can because you know you're going to die. And this is a sacrificial place. And this is where Michael Daly um, received the Medal of Honor and where he was, as I said, the day after he was shot through the head. I've been to the very spot near the medieval wall around the center of Nuremberg. Um, I cried when I was there because I'd followed him all the way from um, Omaha Beach. Um, I can only imagine what he was, what he'd suffered and endured. And the kind of character that he was, there's an eyewitness report that when there was a medieval wall and he shouldn't have put his head above the wall, he was at the front of his company nearly all the time in the last few weeks. He shouldn't have been there. A company commander, as you well know, should not be the point, should not be a, leading scouts. You're supposed to be somewhat behind the action to be able to give your platoon commander's orders. You don't take the point. He didn't care, he wanted to take, and this is a, not a cliche, he really didn't care whether he lived or died. He was beyond life. He wanted to keep guys alive and he would do the hard job if it meant some young boys would go home. Um, and that meant taking out a machine gun nest. One, two, three, four times in a day. That's, that's what he took, that's what he earned the Medal of Honor for. He would take out that because he didn't want his boys dying to do it. Shot through the head, as I said, by a sniper, went down on a pile of rubble, and was the kind of cool customer, and I don't want to go on too long, where he pulled out a pencil from his combat jacket and stuck it down his throat and performed what was basically a primitive tracheotomy on himself. And this is a guy that landed on Omaha Beach in June 1944 and is still in combat at the end of the war. Um, Nuremberg, that's where they fought. That's the rally area. That's Keith Ware right at the far end looking super cool in shades. Pen pusher in California, drafted, never been, never shot, fired a shot in anger. Audie Murphy's company commander, B Company Sicily all the way, Lieutenant Colonel. Um, earned the Medal of Honor for basically doing what his men wouldn't do. He had to show them how to kill and, and take an objective. That's the only time in World War II that five guys from the same unit received on the battlefield the Medal of Honor um, in a place where men, Americans fought and died, and that's Nuremberg. I actually believe it's the only time in Europe in World War II where five guys, any five guys, were receiving the Medal of Honor uh, on the battlefield. There's a massive swastika above the, uh, the stadium. As I read, as where had the medal hung around his neck, they, they detonated masses amount of TNT and the swastika exploded and a chaplain was wounded about 100 yards away by some of the concrete. Because you Yanks, I kind of feel half American, but you Yanks wanted to make sure, damn sure, that they blew up that swastika and they used way too much explosive. <laughs> Audie Murphy, 15th of June 1945, and look how young he is. He's been, he's been in combat for over 200 days. They think that he killed maybe 240 soldiers, I don't know, we don't, it's, it's all BS how many he killed, but most decorated US soldier in World War II, some people say history, and uh, he's still only 20 years old. 
wounded badly twice, the second time hit by a sniper in the buttock. They took out four or five pounds of flesh, gangrenous flesh from his, from his buttock, and, they, and he still went back on the line. And it was after that wound that he earned the Medal of Honor. Life magazine, cover boy, July 1945. Jimmy Cagney in Hollywood saw his face on the front of Life magazine, said, this is unbelievable. Um, he's really good looking, he's a kid. I'm gonna bring him to Hollywood, paid for him to go to Hollywood, and basically made him into a star, paid for acting lessons, he stayed with Jimmy Cagney, and I think you know the, that he became a big uh, Hollywood movie star. 23rd of August, Michael Daly there. You see his eyes closed there because he was really Catholic, he prayed all the time. He prayed in combat. Um, Bob Maxwell, I told you about, mumbled prayers every time he woke up. He said that I didn't. There was only reason, one reason I came back. It's because I, I prayed every time I was conscious. Michael Daly prayed all the time. And that's almost like he's at receiving a benediction there. The eyes are closed. It's, to me, it's a religious moment. Um, largest number of Americans ever gathered in the White House to receive the Medal of Honor at any one time was the 23rd of August, 1943. And Michael Daly is there. I think there were 28 recipients. That's him coming home. He's with his father, who was a highly decorated World War I veteran. His father also served in the European theater, and Michael Daly later was interviewed and said that he wished his father had received the medal, not him. He didn't want to be a public superstar. He didn't. None of the people I write about think they deserved the medal. None of them wanted to receive medals. None of them certainly wanted to be a public hero and a public figure. It was the last thing they wanted. They just wanted to go home, and try somehow to recover. They wanted their mothers to hold them, and they wanted to be at home, and they wanted to disappear. There you go, 1948. He looks like a movie star there. He is a movie star there. That's Keith Ware, killed in Cambodia in 1968. We weren't supposed to be in Cambodia, but we were. Again, doing what he'd done in, throughout the war, which was to lead from the front. He was the only guy that I write about that stayed in the US military and uh, was, was killed tragically, age 53. He said that Audie Murphy was by far the best soldier he ever commanded, and he commanded a lot of guys. There's Audie again, 19, I think died age 46, plane crash. Morris Britt became Lieutenant Governor of Arkansas. Um, died in an operating theatre in surgery uh, from a complication when they did surgery, it was a complication from a wound that he'd received in the war, not the thing that he'd gone into hospital for. Uh, and there's Michael Daly. I'll say one thing about him before I end. I hope I've been really quick. Um, and um, he, before he died, he gave his priest a salute. He saluted his priest. And he said, um, the world needs more peacemakers, not warriors like me. Not people like me. It needs people to make peace. Um, he never found a, a cause, he said, that was greater than uh, the pride and the honor, the deep sense of, uh, I wouldn't describe it as so much patriotism, because I think that's overused, it can be devalued. I see the deep pride in being an American that he felt in World War II, because he said that he knew what it was to be an American in World War II. It was the only time in his life he understood what it was truly to be an American, to be a united American, to serve with working class, middle class kids that were drafted from all over the United States. Kids that were smart, that were different accents. It was the only time in his entire life that a group of Americans had fought together for the same thing from all parts of America, from all different backgrounds. It was the only time he said that he saw America truly, truly united for one cause. To keep each other alive, let's not forget that they weren't flying, they weren't fighting in the Colmar pocket for ideals when they were fighting. They were fighting to stay alive and most importantly, to keep the people around them alive. But they did have ideals, certainly when they look back. And Michael Daly did have ideals. And when these guys were interviewed after the war and when they were interviewed during the war, sometimes they said that they wanted to defeat Nazis that they wanted the people that they were fighting to liberate to be free. And that cause is the greatest cause that any Americans have ever fought for, apart from your liberty, from us, us, us Brits. Um, 
it remains a cause that is more important today than ever. European freedom matters more now than it ever has. We only have to look at the daily news. And an awful lot of you, a lot of Americans gave their lives so that I could grow up in a beautiful continent that has enjoyed the longest period of freedom and liberty and democracy in its history. And he knew what that cause is all about and got to see it in his life. He got to see a free and united and liberal, decent, civilized Europe for all his entire life. So anyway, I've gone on long enough. Thank you. <laughs> I was really drawn in by this. I mean, there's an awful lot of World War II books out there that are just battle after battle after battle, and there's certainly a lot of battles in this. But the story is there, and I'm curious because even even Audie Murphy has been written about a lot. How did how did you get onto this particular story? These these four or five guys who had more medals than anybody else. Um, I kind of I just I looked at the I looked at the history of Third ID and I, and I looked at the thirty six guys and I thought, well, who who interests me? You know, where did they intersect? Did they meet um, during the war? Did they fight together? Did they meet after the war? And um, did they, I needed four characters that I could start, to, I can go from the beginning right to the end with. So Britt did that for me, he, he's, he's there at the right at the beginning. Um, and without going on too long, towards the end of the war there was a kind of competition in the press. In the third ID newspaper, which was called Frontline, they started to actually write stories about Audie Murphy and Morris Britt. And they treated it like a sports story, because you know, Britt had been an athlete and they had headlines like, you know, uh, Murphy equals Brit, you know, a headline because they had the same amount of medals. And then finally it was like, Murphy beats Brit. So they kind of treated it like a competition. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but I was looking for people that, where there was a lot of humanity, there was a lot of, a lot of archive material about, mm -hmm. hopefully. In one case, it was really hard where, um, but I, it was sloppy. I mean, I, you know, I, I just picked the guys that I liked most. It was just a really reflex action, and uh, people seem to have liked, although the, the, the connection between them isn't that profound, it's really a series of vignettes that connect chronologically. Um, it's very self-indulgent, but people seem to have enjoyed it because they get to go through the whole war in Europe, and they get to follow not just the four I write about, they're the linking characters but I also write about lots of other guys that received the Medal of Honor and I try and tell the broader story of, because they, they started at the beginning, the broader story of the liberation of Europe. And that's what I really wanted to do. The Medal of Honor is a device, it, it meant there's a lot of very intense adrenaline driven moments, but you get this very intense story of the liberation of Europe, from the beginning to the end. So I hope, I don't know whether they... Yeah, yeah. You can tell me to stop rambling whenever you like. <laughs> In English you say zip it. You know? <laughs> Anyway. So he's Irish, and yeah. I catch okay. all the lingo at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I've lost my question. Oh, I asked you a little bit about it before we, we came out here. So one thing that always surprises me when I, when I work with service members, and I don't know why after having been in the military, but they're so smart. Like the stories they tell are so hilarious and so so well thought out and so well spoken. I suspect that there are several veterans here tonight. I see a couple. <laughs> so, but the quotes from Eddie Murphy or Audie Murphy blew me away. Just, just they're so beautiful. They're brilliant, and I, I just pulled out one of them. He describes Colmer Pocket as a huge and dangerous bridge her, bridgehead thrusting west of the Rhine like an iron fist. This is, he's 19 years old and this is the way he's talking. He described when he finished, I'll find the kind of girl of whom I once dreamed. I will learn to look at life through uncynical eyes, to have faith, to know love. I will learn to, walk, to work in peace as in war. And finally, finally like countless others, I will learn to live again. He's just a kid. Yeah. yeah, he was a kid. I mean, um, 
Uh, I think there's a kind of um, lack of appreciation of the. Um, I mean, he. I think he finished high. Uh, he was. He left education when he was in the third grade. You know, he didn't. He didn't get to go to West Point. He, he wouldn't have thrived at West Point. Um, one of the reasons why he wouldn't have been there was to go there anyway was because he. He really couldn't write very well. A lot of the letters that I read of his that were to his sister. Lots of misspellings, um, a lot of really great humour, um, a lot of misspellings. Um, and uh, he re didn't want to become an officer uh, because he, he couldn't do the paperwork. And they made him an officer anyway because they said, uh, we'll have the executive officer in the company do that for you so you don't have to write anything. But you don't, you don't, to get, you don't get to be that spectacular a leader, um, you, don't have to have, you don't have those instincts for combat, for making decisions day after day after day. Uh, you don't be that effective at saving lives and taking lives um, without being very, very intelligent. And I think that um, I was comparing you know, someone like Audie Murphy, there, uh, there's really no superlative for how good he was. It sounds crass that I'm saying that. I mean, I've, I've studied World War II for all my life. I grew up reading action comics when I was six years old. I've written about it most of my adult life. And I have never come across anybody that was as effective as a soldier. And that means destroying the enemy and keeping your own side in the game, in the fight. And, um, you know, Tom Brady would maybe, you know, people would say he's the greatest quarterback ever. I'd, I think that Audie Murphy would, trans, would go beyond that kind of superlative. You know, he was that good. And I, people would have to say that, you know, when Tom Brady makes a, a pass, there's a, very, a high level of, a very high level of intelligence. Very high level of intelligence. And uh, you're making decisions very quickly. You're seeing the football field or the battlefield very quickly. So. Yeah, very intelligent. Of course, there's another scene where they're at the Von Trapp mansion, and there's a soldier defecating in a, toy, in a um, bathroom, and he hears gunfire and comes running out. And <laughs> um, he goes, he walks down a, a corridor, and, it, and he goes into a room, and it's Audie Murphy taking pot shots at a, a painting of Adolf Hitler. Um, actually, in the Sound of Music, it was the Von Trapp home. And the third ID had it as a headquarters at the end of the war in Salzburg. Um, so yeah, he. Um, I don't want to keep going on about Audie Murphy because we can talk about others. But uh, you know, there was one description that came across that you know that someone had seen him moving across a landscape, a mountainside in Italy, and they said he didn't look human. He looked like a, a feral predator. He was that low and moved that quickly that it didn't didn't. You know, he looked more like a, a wolf or something that wasn't quite human. I mean, he was a scary, scary dude. You know. um, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'd like to ask one more quick question and then open it up sure. for people. Um, so one of the things I really enjoyed is the wrong word, but appreciated about the book. Um, you talk an awful lot about the aftermath. Um, Brit's pain, eternal pain for the rest of his life, Audie Murphy's divorce and alcohol and um, affairs, just depression. Y you present them all as heroes, but you also talk about how broken it, it left them and, and how important it was to them to talk about that as well, or as, or as to not take credit or to, to praise war, I guess. Um. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, uh, I've never been in a war, and I, to be honest, I feel very grateful. I never, I never ever really wanted, I don't want to go near it. I could have had, I did possibly have the opportunity to be, go and report on a war. Um, I wasn't even courageous enough to do that. I didn't want to do it. Smart. Not like you. <laughs> um, but I, I spent an awful lot of time with World War II veterans that, um, told me honestly when they started to talk, which wasn't until about 20 years ago. Um, they told me, I felt with great sincerity and emotion, 
often when they were lost in the moment of reliving what they'd been through, the trauma, basically, of Omaha Beach for an hour or two, um, where I could actually, I actually remember sitting there looking at the guy that had been in the first wave on Omaha Beach, a Bedford boy, and he'd never talked to anybody about it really in detail before, and he was right back there. And um, I, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I've, I've heard a lot of stories about what it did to them, and it deeply, deeply traumatized them. Um, and I think that the thing that I admire most about all the characters that I write about in this book, and um, nearly all the you know all the people that I've interviewed over the years that um, didn't die of alcoholism, didn't kill themselves, uh, didn't die at a young age because there were an awful lot of them. We just didn't we didn't have a culture of therapy, and we didn't have the term PTSD, and we didn't talk about them, we didn't write about them, but there were an awful lot. Hundreds of thousands of Americans came back psychologically profoundly wounded. Um, and I think that one of the things that I was most impressed by with these characters, um, and most of my, about a lot of the people I've written about, is that they never put the war behind them. Mm. Never ever, I don't believe, even when they told me they put it behind them, I didn't believe a word of it. I never believed that, ever. What they did was they struggled and struggled and struggled and they put it to the side of them. And they moved on. And they had very productive lives, even though Audie Murphy had terrible PTSD, really bad, became a very chronic gambler, not an alcoholic, but had very serious issues in his life. He still made over 30 movies. He still turned up at every Veterans Day, every event that he was invited to by the US military, he turned up and he presented the image of the hero and did his, did his duty. They all did. Uh, even though they struggled with the pain and, the, uh, and one of them was a heavy drinker, a couple of them were pretty heavy drinkers. Um, they had an awful lot to be... They were very wounded. They were deeply wounded people. Um, you can't see people die. You can't see young people die in front of you. You can't endure that, that agony, that survivor's guilt all the things they did without being deeply affected by it, but they were very productive and they were very, they contributed enormously to their communities. They had, they did their very, very best and I think that's what I admire about so much, I admire so much about all of those guys that came back, you know? Um, there were so few that saw the sharp end. Um, I, I read one statistic, I might be wrong, that less than 5% of Americans that were in the European theatre actually were shut out or had to use a weapon. Um, very, very few people came back to America from those 16 million that knew what it was to kill and, and see people killed. Certainly over a long period of time. And they came back to an America that they couldn't even recognize, that hadn't been bombed, that wasn't like Nuremberg, where there weren't millions of people that were homeless where they hadn't seen massive starvation and displacement, where they, um, where they hadn't seen someone, where someone hadn't kissed them and hugged them and said thank you and meant it, because their home and their, their homes had been liberated and their families had hope, where they wouldn't be deported, where they wouldn't be murdered, they wouldn't be killed, because a, a kid with a, a felt patch from the third ID came along from Arkansas and you know, lost a lot of his buddies, giving them a life. Mm. They never saw that gratitude when they came home. Not in the eyes, not in the heart, not in the soul. Mm. Because the people thanking them in America had, had not been given something that really mattered. I hadn't thought of it that way before. I think um, our veterans stay. So anyway, I'm going on about it too long, but I admire them because they survived mm. peace as well as the war. And I think for a lot of them it was just as hard, harder. I've often heard from people that, you know, in the Bedford Boys, I interviewed a sister. Um, her brother survived Omaha Beach and 19 of his friends that he grew up with were killed. And she told me that when she first saw her brother, he didn't go home. He found her in the hospital in Virginia and went to see her first. And he said to her, I can't go home without you and see our parents. 
because my brother was killed there. Mm. So we went to see his sister so that he could go home and see his parents with her to support him. And she told me that it was harder for those who came home than it was, you know, in a way the ones that were killed were lucky. It was the guys that had to deal with it for the rest of their life that had the real pain wow. and uh, were the real heroes, she said. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know whether that answers your question, but... I think so. Shall we open it up? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody have a question? Thank you uh, for being here. Very interesting. So my question is um, maybe um, for you, sir, and then Kelly, maybe you can answer. With the Medal of Honor winners from World War II coming back, and it, you know, maybe they were, you know, seen at a parade or, you know, Who Am I, a game show, or Johnny Carson, where now we have social media and everybody is scrutinized. But did Medal of Honor winners, like, during the Korean War, reach out to those Medal of Honor winners from the Korean War and the Vietnam War? And how is the Medal of Honor community now? Um, I would imagine they're a, t a tight group. Uh, Kelly can answer this uh, more recently in terms of the way that they're scrutinized better than I can, but um, they're a very tight group. I think there's like um, only less than 4,000 Americans have ever received the Medal of Honor, and there are not many around today. I mean, we only have one from World War II. I think that um, you know more medals should be given. There are political reasons why more aren't given, um, and it's a rare thing indeed to receive the Medal of Medal of Honor. Maybe, thankfully, we're not in a war right now—a serious war where lots of people are dying. But um, it's a very tight brotherhood. Yeah. The Medal of Honor Society is very active. Um, they do a similar thing to the thing that, you know, Holly Rotundi and the Friends of the World War II Memorial, I'm, a, uh, I'm on the board of the Friends, and Medal of Honor Society, we do very different things, but we have one thing that we do actually share, which is to try and educate people about civic values mm -hmm. and about giving back to your community, about what, you know, integrity, honor, courage, sacrifice, what that means and how it should be revered and how it can, how younger generations can learn from these examples. If, they, if we're doing anything, we should be saying, this is an example of how you can, you know, you can be courageous and you can encourage people to be, to lead others and to, to give back to their country. Um, so yes, um, it's a very tight knit brotherhood indeed. It's a very special thing to have that around your neck. and. Uh, you know, I, I only once, I, I once in public sat in front of a guy from World War II who received the, the Medal of Honor, and he was in the 45th Infantry Division, and he was a Native American. Um, he's one of only, I think there were only th three from the 45th Infantry Division that received the Medal of Honor. And um, he was a scary dude. I mean, he was really scared the hell out of me. And it's like, you know, what the hell are you doing on this stage? You know, and I'm like, well, I'm like what the hell am I doing on this stage? So, <laughs> Shouldn't have been there, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he, he enjoyed his celebrity in that sense, but it was, you know, um, Bob Maxwell told me and uh, Michael Daly later said that they, they did, it, there was a great immense sense of honor of, of having that hang around the neck, but the medal meant the unit they belonged to and it meant the men they had fought with and it represented the pride in the unit. So they would represent, the medal they were wearing represented the guys that they'd fought with and they had died with them. It was a way of symbolizing their sacrifice. That's what I heard from several recipients. But I don't know whether you can answer the question about, <laughs> I would hate to receive it now with social media and you know, you do one thing wrong. You, Bob Maxwell told me that when he had the medal around his neck, I, I, he said to me, it weighs really heavy. My entire life, this has been very heavy around my neck. Mm. I can't get drunk in public. I can't divorce my wife. I have to behave a certain way. I'm not that guy. And he said, you know, none of, I don't think any of us were those kind of like, we're not public, we're not superheroes. We're not super perfect. We're not, you know, we're human beings, you know? And everyone's flawed. Everyone makes mistakes. Mm. Everyone makes terrible mistakes sometimes. They, by accident or, you know, and not everyone's a moral, perfect being, you know, um, 
and I think they, a lot of Medal of Honor recipients have felt enormous stress and a, a lot of weight. Bob, Bob Maxwell was a mechanic for the next 30 years. You know, it, 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 everyone would say, oh, you know, you're the guy that run, received the Medal of Honor. He was in a, he was in a, a chicken coop in Besançon. I've been near where it was. It's a block of flats now, whatever. And a grenade, he was a wire man. He was a wire cutter. He laid wire from one company to the next. You know, communications. And, you know, there were lots of people that were really doing the killing around him. He, he'd laid wire, he said. I said, I just, all I did was lay wire every day. And one day, this grenade came over. I saw it come down. There's a chicken coop, and it bounced, and I jumped on it. That's, I didn't even think about what I was doing. I didn't make any decision. It wasn't conscious at all. I just saw it bounce. I saw the grenade, and I just smothered it. And I did not deserve the medal on it for that decision or that action. I just instinctively did it. But that, for the rest of his life, meant that he was a, a superstar. Now, obviously, he earned it by saving the lives of guys around him. That's a classic case of why you would do it. But it was not for him a, an action that was deliberate. It was just a split second. You know, half of us in the, maybe a, half of us in the room in a split second. We don't know what what we would do if that happened. If a grenade landed next to you there, what would you do? You know? Right. You, you react. So. Yeah, I would say that today's veterans or, or Medal of Honor recipients are, the accusation is that there are a lot fewer of them. There's only a handful because of what you were just talking about. If you earn the Medal of Honor and then you end up in a, getting a DUI or something, it looks bad on the military. So the accusation now is that if someone isn't super vetted, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get it. So the group is a lot smaller now, yeah. Which I think is outrageous. I'll say that openly. Mm -hmm. you know, if you, in World War II, um, there was a guy, when I was researching the uh, um, Brit, I came across um, some papers in his archives, and uh, there was a guy that received, he was the first American to receive the Medal of Honor for actions in um, Italy. And at the time, he was, a, he was a huge star back in America, but he, was, he became a, a really bad drunk quickly, and during World War II. So I came across uh, official correspondence saying that, you know, we, we, need, we need a guy like Brit. I mean, he's, a, he's perfect. I mean, if he had two arms, that would be even better. But, you know, he's really good looking. He's a professional athlete, football player. He's great on radio. They were saying this, he's great on radio, he's great, he's, he's awesome. Um, and we can't use this guy. We need to replace, we, we can't use this guy because we thought about using him because he got it earlier. And he's like, you know, he would have been great, but he's a really heavy boozer. You know, we can't have an alcoholic represent our propaganda efforts. We can't have, we can't have someone that is so obviously damaged by what they've been through. You know, they couldn't put Brit on the front cover of Life magazine because he's missing an arm, and that's not the poster boy you want for GI Joe in World War Two. You know. So. Are there any? Other? Yes. Yes, yeah. Jen. <laughs> I have a question about a World War II Medal of Honor recipient uh, because it's related to a family member. Not the Medal of Honor recipient, okay. but his radio man is a cousin. Uh, and right. I, I, my grandmother was a military nurse for 40 years. And I went to right. visit her while she was serving in Germany. And she took me to the Netherlands to an American uh, cemetery. And that's when I first started learning about World War II when I was five, I think, and been fascinated ever since. Well, a couple of years ago, I went to the 75th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy to study up a little bit more on family, because I had more of a family history than I thought. And Robert E. Doran uh, was the radio man for Lieutenant Colonel Cole, who received the Medal of Honor in September of 1944, and was wondering if you had heard anything of that story. Mm. Out of the 472, I'm not like, I don't know every, <laughs> tell, please tell us, go on. Oh, I was wondering if you had more okay, information because I'm still trying he, to learn. Do you know where he landed? Do you know, was he yes, he was in the Netherlands, uh, 101, okay, the 502nd. Okay, 101st Airborne. Ah, okay, so he was in the 101st Airborne? Yes. The, yeah, Mark. So he's the guy that, um, 
So hang on, okay, I do know about this. Uh, he was, so the radio guy was the radio guy for the guy that received the, the Medal of Honor, okay. Right. Um, Who was killed too. Okay, yeah, that's, there's only two guys from the 101st Airborne that received the Medal of Honor, and that's the, there were, actually the two medals were earned a day apart in Operation Market Garden, mm -hmm. so that you are related to your six degrees of separation, <laughs> that's extremely special. It is. And I've been trying Airborne, to learn more 100 ever 100st Airborne, since. only two in, in World War II, a day apart, and you're connected to <laughs> one of them. Market Garden, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I just wanted to learn more. <laughs> I've managed to work that out through a process of deduction. You know? That's cool. So, nice. Yeah, that's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh, what was his name? Yeah. Uh, John Howard. Okay. Okay. Five oh second. Yeah. Why? Bastogne. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred first Airborne were, you know, I often say, and I won't go on too long, but I often say, you know, I, I kind of make a joke of it, and some people take it the wrong way, which is that I say, well, you know, the third ID is three hundred and thirty-five, the the forty-fifth is, you know, second longest. You know, and those glamour boys in the 101st Airborne, <laughs> you know, who were in, they won World War II, we all know that, you know, because the Band of Brothers, they were, you know, there's only, it was only the 101st Airborne. And after combat, you know, after three or four weeks, they got to go back to England and have a full English breakfast and date English girls and, you know, have a nice time and then go back and <laughs> go back. Whereas the 45th and the 3rd and other ones just stayed in combat all the time. But no, they're an amazing unit. I'm, I'm writing about the 101st Airborne now at Bastogne. And um, I mean, talk about grit, you know, in the worst possible conditions, just wow, yeah. And you know, they, they, were, they were considered an elite unit in World War II. You know, you didn't, you didn't get drafted into the 101st Airborne. And uh, I've been to actually the, the, first, the place where the very first guy from the 101st Airborne drop down into France in Normandy. Same. And I'm going with the Friends of the World War II Memorial. We're going to be actually go to the spot this June. We did that a couple you did of years that, yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they did a lot of reenactment yeah. jumps. I followed yeah. it through. Saint Mary Glees and Saint Jean mm -hmm. de Baraville. Yeah. And we went, we took a bunch of, yeah. a bunch, a bunch of World War II vets that were there yeah. uh, that day. So if you need any World War II yeah. vet contacts in the area, yeah. <laughs> I know quite a few. Yeah. So um, the book covers a lot of geography, right? We're from Italy all the way through Germany. And you know, I was, I'm impressed by how many stories are packed into, it's, it's really not a long book. I started it yesterday and I am already halfway through. It's a very fast paced read. Is there anything that kind of fell on the cutting room floor or that a story that stuck out that you didn't fit into the narrative or didn't have time for that you'd be willing to share with us about um, one of your characters? Uh, you know, I, um, there were so many Medal of Honor recipients that I could have gone on about that I, I dropped a lot. You know, I, um, originally I was going to do a paragraph or two at least on every single Medal of Honor recipient from the third ID, but that would have meant 37, you know, couple of paragraphs here and there. So what I did was I narrowed it down to Medal of Honor recipients who were, in one case, seen by Audie Murphy or received the, action, received the Medal of Honor for an action where my characters were also critically involved in an action. You know, so cross, crossing the Rapido River, um, the Volturno, I focused, I gave a couple of paragraphs to guys that got the job done and therefore allowed the unit that I'm writing about to, to move forward. So it gave, it gave the narrative motion, otherwise it would have bogged down. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to write, I'm tr I was trying to write so that the book is as quick a read as possible. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely mercenary about this. I want it to read really fast. I don't want to s slow things down. Um, so there was a lot that got put on the cutting room floor. Uh, amazing actions that were just, you know, were just as incredible as the ones that I write about, you know, um, that were, I was like, oh my God, I, I'd like to write about that, but it was a long way away and it would have, it would have been in a different regiment 
in a different battle at a different time and to jump from this narrative going this direction to here without any real direct reason to do that, you know, would have, yeah. Great question though, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Um, I've met you before. Um, my name is Melissa. I've uh, kind of been in touch with you for oh, the yeah, past yeah, yeah. few years. Oh, yeah, Library of Congress. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for being here. Oh, and, no, why? Uh, so I started writing a book about my grandfather's unit about 13 years ago. It started as an interview, and um, he was in the 87th Chemical Mortar Battalion, and it was supposed to be a factual just interview, and it evolved into a book. And um, so there's my grandfather and then three other guys, two, two men who became really good friends of mine. Um, when I first kind of encountered you, they were still alive, and I was very passionate about my I project. Remember. And um, they've since passed away, but they helped me a lot with the research after my grandfather died. And But the fourth man, um, he, he was actually the captain of the unit, Captain Williams, and he died two days after D-Day, after being injured on um, Utah Beach. And so my project, my question is, when you write about someone who you've never met, who died during the war or something, um, so of all the men I've written about, the four men, I feel the largest responsibility is with Captain Williams because he's never spoken about his story. He, right. um, and I'm just wondering how it is for you when you you actually interview a veteran and, and get their story from them and then when you tell a story of someone who died in combat or that you've never met before um, because he's he's kind of the reason I've, I haven't given up on my project is just because he's always in my head and I want to tell his story and I just was wondering the difference for you if you feel a difference at all. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a book called The Longest Winter about the Battle of the Bulge. And the, the star character of that, he didn't want to be the star, was the platoon commander. He was 20 years old, most decorated platoon of World War II, American platoon. And I interviewed him a lot, too much probably. And, um, you know, I remember being in Florida with him, this is 20 years ago, and uh, I was in his condo, and he was sort of sat where you are from me, a bit closer, and he was wearing shorts. And I asked him for like probably the third or fourth time, where were you wounded? And he was such a gentleman that he'd never shown any kind of irritation towards me, which was incredible because I can be incredibly irritating. And um, he looked at me and then he said, there. And there was a scar from like here up to there. And I, this is the fourth day that I sat in front of him with his shorts on. And I hadn't, you know. So my answer is that I felt he's in. I, he's on, on almost every page of my book. Um, I interviewed him an awful lot, and I was ex extremely worried about how he would react to several episodes in the book. Um, there's an episode in the book where there's an interior monologue because he told me what he was thinking. And he's looking up at a cuckoo clock in, uh, on the first day of the Battle of the Bulge, um, two or three of his men are really badly wounded. They're bleeding badly. He's soaked in the blood of a, a, a guy that he considered a really good friend, a 19-year-old that he thinks is going to die. And uh, he's 20 years old. He's been in combat for one day. And he's, you know, he told me, I, I asked him, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? And he said, I, I had never been, I'd never felt such a failure in my life. I was humiliated, I was defeated. Um, these people I was in charge of were probably gonna die. Their blood was all over me. I, I had never felt more of a failure in my life. And that's what he told me. And I, so in the scene in the book, I have an interior monologue. I have him thinking that, which was for me was awesome as a storyteller, but I was really worried about how he might react to that and other incidences, um, sorry, other incidents, where he, um, where he was picked up in the arms of a guy that he saw as his father figure, he was his commanding officer, and he picked him up like a baby as he was literally dying of malnutrition in a POW camp, and he told me how it felt to be held by someone who considered, he considered as his father, substitute for his father, you know, 
So I included all that, you know, and I thought, oh my God, I'm being really personal here. And he, he, didn't, he didn't say anything about it. He was such a beautiful gentleman, you know. Yeah, so um, just to, when, when you were saying um, as a father figure, that's why my grandfather didn't talk about it until yeah. actually just 13 years ago because he saw Captain Williams as a father figure and it was such a trauma. Yeah. I just would love to thank both Alex and Kelly for coming to share information. You. Okay. Um, <laughs> you this, this was a rare opportunity to have, um, to have them here, and I'm very glad that everybody took advantage of coming. Um, and don't forget there are books outside in the hallway, and um, they will be signing books. So, yeah. Thank you. A shout out yes. to the Friends of the World War II Memorial too. Please, who helped organize please this. do. Yes, thank you. and thank you, Holly. Thank you. <laughs> no, you can say more. <laughs> no, it's just an amazing organization. We have an incredible education project, and well worth you checking out. And they're actually located in this building yeah. too. Funnily enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So it's a fantastic organization. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so so much. It's really nice of you to give the time. Wonderful.